Imagine how risque this must have seemed when it was first made 150 years ago. The Penny Peep Show machine was invented by an Englishman, William Kennedy Laurie Dickinson, and it caused a sensation when it was launched in 1894. Ah, fantastic! The Victorian appetite for amusement spawned a whole new entertainment industry. It was nothing short of a cultural revolution. It gave birth to weekends, tourism, and even celebrity. Imagine, if you can, a sleepy little seaside town of just 700 people. Well cut off from neighbouring towns, they got their supplies twice a week on a cart from Preston, 18 miles away. There were just four pubs and a few lodging houses strung out along the peaty stream that flows into the sea here. Well, that was all there was to the sleepy hamlet of Blackpool until the Victorians turned it into this the leisure capital of the North. Blackpool became the world's first working-class tourist resort, and even today, the whole town is still dedicated to amusing thousands of holidaymakers. Industrialization brought some advantages. It liberated the rural laborers from the tyranny of the soil. For the first time, people had spare time and spare cash. When the railways arrived, the seaside was in for a rude shock. The railway came to Blackpool in the 1840s, and it wasn't long before the pleasure seekers followed. Workers were beginning to get Saturdays as well as Sundays off, and the weekend was born. Towns like Blackpool were transformed in the space of just a few decades. But the seaside wasn't only fun, it was good for you too. Victorian experts came up with scientific reasons to take in the sea air. In 1839, scientists discovered a new gas, which they called ozone. It's actually a form of oxygen. Now, you get ozone when you let off an electrical spark. And because a lot of quack doctors were using electrical machines on people, they came to think that this smell they got with electrical sparks was healthy. What's more, ozone is a very powerful antiseptic. It's used even today in sewage treatment. So healthiness was what people associated with it. Now, when you come to the seaside, you often get the smell of old seaweed decomposing a bit, and the smell is very like the smell of ozone. So Victorians invented the idea that the whole of the seaside is full of ozone and very healthy. The extraordinary things are that, one, there's no truth in it. It's a complete myth. And secondly, people still today think that sea air is healthy. Sea bathing was all the rage. Not for the faint-hearted on these northern shores, it was supposed to be extremely beneficial. Oh, some doctors actually recommended sea bathing for your health, especially, especially if the water was very, very cold. And indeed, in the north, in Scarborough, they instituted nude sea bathing. Very risque. I tried it once, but I am not going to do it today. If you were less of an exhibitionist, there was another way to take the sea air. This is the North Pier at Blackpool. It was opened on the 23rd of May, 1863, to tremendous celebrations. It was the talk of the town. In fact, it was the talk of the whole coastline, because piers were the very latest development in the exciting new fashion of the seaside. It was also the latest in engineering technology, designed and built by Eugenius Birch. Birch's piers were stronger, bigger, safer and cheaper than any that had gone before. 
Eugenius Birch came up with a new and very cunning system. He built his pillars out of iron like this one here and he could use as many as he liked and that meant he could make his piers as long and as wide as he wanted. And the way he did it was this. Imagine that's the bedrock and this is the sand. He would put a wrought iron column like this which went all the way down and then actually screwed with a screw on the end into the bedrock and then over it he would drop a cast iron column like that wider very very strong the cast iron can take the whole weight of the uh, pier above and this is it this is the cast iron still in wonderful nick after 150 years with no modern amusements or fun fairs North Pier feels very much like it must have done when it was first built. Back then, there was no need of more entertainment. A fearless journey along the pier was adventure enough. This pier was a tremendous hit. It attracted no less than 275,000 visitors in the first year alone. It's about a quarter of a mile long. It's still a wonderful experience walking out here. Victorian ladies were a little bit nervous. At high tide, they said it was like walking on water, and a lot of them felt seasick. But I guess on a windy day, it would feel a bit like, well, being in a ship in a storm. And it was on the decks of the first luxury liners that another Victorian seaside staple first appeared, the deck chair. Even now, a day at the seaside just isn't the same without what to the Victorians was the coolest new trend, ice cream. Ice cream didn't come to the seaside until cheap ice became available, transported from Norway. But what did Victorian ice cream taste like? I'm going to make some with the help of food historian Robin Weir. Robin, hi. So what's the first stage in this process? All right, we start off with the barrel and we get crushed ice, we break it up right. and we spread it round the bottom here. Uh, we then put the machine... Bed it down into the... And bed it down... Ice salt. ...into the ice. What, what is this machine? Well, this is a very rare machine. It's a Victorian machine. I only know of six that actually exist. Really? It's made by Mrs Marshall, who was, I think, without question, the leading Victorian cook. Oh, really? She wrote cookery books and she wrote two books on ice cream, brilliant books on ice cream, and she made equipment. She was a one-woman industry. Now we get the ice cream mixture. Uh, it's Mrs. Marshall's cheap ice cream mix. It's made mainly with corn flour and milk. There's only a tiny bit of cream has been added. So, no eggs, for example? No. You see, they were too expensive. How expensive did they get? We have a receipt from Gunter's, the confectioners in Berkeley Square. And by today's prices, ice cream was about 55 pounds a kilo. 55 pounds? Oh, yes, 55 wow. pounds a kilo. After 10 minutes of hard work with Mrs. Marshall's wonderful machine, the ice cream is ready to eat. Oh, yes. OK, there we are. It's all solidified. So could I have a little taste? Try a, try okay. a taste. Hmm. That's really nice. <laughs> How would it actually have been served? Well, if you had come onto the beach, it would have been served on a penny lick. Penny lick. Which is an item like this. Now, this is a glass, and they varied. In fact, this one is almost completely full of glass. There's almost no space in it. I mean, it was a real ripoff. So you just put a tiny scoop so on what, there, what, what happened was they would give you this, and they would dress it up like that. Right. And then you would lick that. Right. Now, the thing was, then you'd give it back to the vendor who would use it for the next person. That sounds pretty disgusting to well, me. Well, they occasionally get wiped with a dirty cloth, but they didn't get wet. Uh, how many people have used this today? Nobody has used that today. Oh, it's been good. beautifully oh. washed before we came. Mm. As the crowds flocked to the seaside, ever more ingenious ways were devised to separate them from their hard-earned cash. Mechanical rides were designed to thrill the late Victorians. It was the beginning of Blackpool Pleasure Beach. One of the pioneers of the Pleasure Beach was an American called Hiram Maxim. 
Hiram Maxim had made a fortune inventing the world's first machine gun, but what he really wanted to do was fly. He actually built a fast, steam-powered plane, but on a test run in 1894, it ran horribly out of control, crashed and broke up. So, as his last resort, he built this terrific thing. This is his original machinery, and it powers a wonderful fairground ride up above. I'm going to have a go. Maxim's flying machine is the oldest ride in Blackpool. Modern roller coasters may be bigger and faster, but this century-old machine is still quite a ride today. Isn't it amazing? Practically the whole of Blackpool is Victorian. It was put up at tremendous speed in just one generation and all there to entertain the masses. The new leisure industry was taking off. The railways could take people anywhere and Thomas Cook was the first to offer cheap day excursions in 1841. Within 20 years, he was taking tourists to America and the Nile. The aspiring classes weren't the only market. Wealthy Victorians were also getting away from it all in style. For the Victorian pleasure seekers, travel itself was a form of entertainment, especially if you had the money to travel in one of these luxurious Pullman cars. George Pullman was an American pioneer of luxury travel, building his first trains in 1864. They were the ultimate in late 19th century technology and opulence. The first all Pullman service, the Pullman Limited Express, started in 1881. It ran from London to Brighton and it was the first train ever to be lit by electricity. These cars date back to when the service was in its heyday. No expense has been spared. Every coach has its own unique decor. And even the loos, you have to look at this wonderful mosaic floor, individually designed for every coach. And of course, the service is first class too. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Sir Larry. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. The Pullman trains were the first ever to have meals served on board, and the idea was a fantastic success. I'm not surprised, just look at this grub. Ah, oh, excellent. Pan-fried red mullet. I shall have to come here again. There were plenty of places where the rich could go to avoid their inferiors. They travelled to exotic resorts in the Alps, to the casinos of the Riviera, and also to newly fashionable parts of Britain, like Scotland. It was Queen Victoria herself who invented the idea of Scotland as a holiday playground. The royal couple came here in 1842, 44 and 47. On their third trip to Scotland, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert came to stay right here at Schoon Palace near Perth. Other visitors to Scotland could emulate the royal couple by enjoying the traditional exclusive pleasures of hunting, fishing and, of course, shooting. Clay pigeon shooting was invented because, unlike real oh. pigeons, clays fly on cue and always in the right direction. Pull. Pull. No, 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 hold it! You're doing it all wrong! The Victorians did it rather differently. They actually invented clay pigeon shooting, but they didn't use boring asphalt discs. They used these, Bogardus balls. This isn't actually an original Bogardus ball, this is a modern replica. And this is a replica of the trap he used to fire them. Now, it's actually powered by knicker elastic. If you look down here, you can see there's a load of knicker elastic. And to arm it, you have to push this down like this, and then engage that in the release mechanism. Then you put your ball in the cup there. Clear below. 
not bad. Perhaps not quite as good as the asphalt one, but still not bad. Now, this reloaded. Now, have a look at this. Pull! Ah, oh, it's not bad, is it? Very impressive. Tell me about these Bogardus balls. Well, that's an original one. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's all ribbed. Is that just for show? No, serves a purpose. Stop shot glancing off it, ensures it breaks when you hit it. Oh, I see. And, and were they empty like this? No, it was full of feathers. So on breaking, you had a nice little puff oh, of feathers. Oh, I see. So like air. a puff of smoke. Exactly. That's, that's terrific, isn't it? Who was Bogardus? Bogardus, Captain A.H. Bogardus, was an American. He was the inventor of glass ball shooting. It was originally known as Bogardus Sport. Came over to this country in the 1880s. He was a good shot, was he? He was a very good shot. He invented the trap and it was a substitute for live pigeon shooting. Do you think I could have a go? I'm sure you can. Real Bogardus balls are rare antiques, so we've oh. had some replicas made out of resin. I missed. Oh! oh. Well, I can't have been far away. Guns ready to go. Right. Oh! Ready, you go. Yeah! Feathers! I got, well, not a lot, but I got a few feathers out of it. I score one! <laughs> so, look, there we are. You can see where all the pellets went in on one side and came out on the other, pushing the feathers with them. It didn't quite explode because it's made of plastic and not glass, but I really did hit it. Anyway, I reckon I deserve a bit of a reward. Cheers. But you didn't have to travel to be entertained. There was something for every class of Victorian pleasure seeker at the local theatre. Classical drama, opera and ballet were enjoying an enormous boom among the well-to-do. And there were also the new popular forms of entertainment, the melodrama, the pantomime and the music hall. And those cost just a few pennies. New theatres sprang up all over the country as the demand for entertainment boomed. And hand in hand came technical innovation to make the experience as dazzling as possible. Before they had electric lighting, they had to make their white light on the stage by a new and potentially dangerous method. A Cornish chap called Goldsworthy Gurney had invented the oxyhydrogen blowpipe. Gurney's torch was powered by hydrogen and oxygen, which were pumped in from beneath the stage, but it was dangerous. One wayward spark, and your history. So instead of storing large amounts of these gases, some theatres opted for a more DIY approach and made their own on the premises. So, Mike, how would they have made their oxygen and hydrogen? They used cheap materials, um, such as iron and sulfuric acid. And I have some sulfuric acid in this um, right. flask here. That's and I've nice. got some iron wool. Right. And I've got a few nails. OK. So let's see what happens when we put those in there. It's fizzing. It's fizzing. That's hydrogen. Producing hydrogen. Off. So this is actually hydrogen blowing up this balloon? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Good. And the oxygen? And the oxygen, they used two solids. They right. used potassium chlorate and manganese dioxide, which I have in this tube here. We have to get it very, very hot. So, we've got hydrogen and we've got oxygen. Now, how dangerous is hydrogen? Well, hydrogen's very uh, flammable, and I think we can show you that, because I have a balloon up there, which I filled earlier. Right. I have a very long match. So, let's, uh, let's try it. So, fingers in ears, yes? Fingers in ears, I, th I think, yes. Here we go. And we're almost there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can certainly okay. hear it all right. Yes, yes. indeed. Terrific. Yes. And uh, th that was just hydrogen, yes? That was just hydrogen. Now, what happens if you mix it with oxygen? Well, I've done that. I've got a balloon, uh, the white balloon. The hydrogen is mixed with the oxygen inside the balloon. So that's what he had in his blowpipe, in fact. Indeed. At the, end, at the end of the blowpipe, uh, so you mean this might be worse? This should be worse. <laughs> Let's see how it works with the blowtorch. With the blowtorch, um, it's that reaction in a more controlled way. Now, I like the hydrogen. Gurney uh, invented this blowtorch and got a gold medal for it, but didn't know what to do with it. We've got hydrogen and oxygen coming in together here, mixing and making this very, very hot flame. It gets up to 
almost 2,000 degrees. I'm not going to put my finger in there. He tried putting all sorts of different things into the flames to see what would happen, and he was surprised by lime. Could we winch it in now, Mike? This is a lump of limestone, and it, you simply put it in the flame, and anything you put in will glow, but limestone is special. It starts to emit its own light, and you can see that fantastically bright white light. And all you need to do is to put it behind a lens like this, and you can make a very directional beam, in fact, a spotlight. And they started using these in the theatre, and they were called limelights. Follow spots in modern theatres are still called limes, and the phrase in the limelight speaks for itself. But life in the spotlight can be harsh, as one star turn discovered. In 1882, the great French actress Sarah Bernhardt was persuaded to come here for a special one-off performance on the 28th of August. She was the first ever world-class artiste to be tempted to Blackpool, and 4,000 people crammed into the Winter Gardens to see her. Unfortunately, she had a terrible cold and she'd lost her voice. But even if they had been able to hear, they wouldn't have understood because the whole play was in French. As it was, a loud northern voice was heard from the audience ab above the near silence. Speak up, lass. Not that a soul can hear what you're saying. We ain't paid for the likes of that. Get off, the pot, the pot. Get off. We, we want the us money back. Get off. Monsieur. The management was forced to refund all ticket holders after the Divine Sarah walked off stage. Sarah wrote a letter to the local paper complaining. She said, Je suis une artiste et pas une exhibition. Now, it was quite fun because at the rival theatre, the Prince of Wales down the road, the star turn that week was a low comedian who brought the house down when he said, Je suis an exhibition, a pas an artiste. For the early Victorians, these were the biggest celebrities of the day, seen everywhere on stamps, coins and in grand paintings. These portraits of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert hang in the National Portrait Gallery in London, which opened in 1856, so that the hoi polloi could come and admire the stars of the day. There have always been celebrities, but during Victoria's reign, there was a tremendous growth in the number and indeed the range of personalities who were celebrated. This cult of celebrity was brought about by a technological breakthrough. Victorian portrait artists didn't have to use brush and oils. They could paint with light itself. Some chemicals change color when they're exposed to light. Now, this paper has been painted with silver nitrate, and if I leave it out in the sun, it'll eventually go black. It's really easy to make sun pictures or pictures of leaves, for example. I simply take a leaf like this, put it on top of a piece of paper, and let the sun do the rest. Only I have to hold it down with a piece of glass so it doesn't blow away. Just watch this. As the chemically treated paper is exposed to light, it darkens, while the area covered by the leaf stays light. Modern photography relies on exactly the same principle. After an hour or so, depending on the weather, let's see what we've got. There we are. Leaves come off. I've moved them a bit now. And there you can see, there's the leaf and there's the picture. You can even see the veins in the leaf. That's really pretty. Taking this process one stage further, Victorians used a camera and a lens to take pictures of everything, especially people and little card-sized photos became collectible. Well, the whole thing was that you made multiple copies, and so you could exchange them with your network of family and friends, but you could also begin to collect photographs of the celebrity figures of the day. You could put faces to the names. And, of course, the first picture that we have is of Victoria and Albert. So we've got the royals of the day, and of course that ends as the sort of that offers the template of the ideal family. Right. But you could then arrange images of your own family around. 
Uh, now, this is a lovely album which looks at celebrity figures from the theatre. So it's the actors and actresses of the day. And you've got the great actor manager, Henry Irving, and the beautiful oh. star, Alan Terry. She's lovely, isn't she? She is. Pity and about the hat, but... She would be what they call a sure card. This was a card that was guaranteed to sell by the tens of thousands. Right. You'd be able to buy these pictures from stationers, and you'd see them arranged in stationers' windows, from booksellers. You'd also be able to buy them sometimes from street traders. At last, people could see what their superstars really looked like. And if photographs caused a stir, imagine what happened when they started moving. Moving pictures were made possible by the invention of celluloid. Once they had this stuff, they could actually take a whole sequence of still pictures and then look at them one after the other and they'd give the idea of movement. The trouble was, how are they going to show them? Because nobody had yet invented the projector. To begin with, a whole lot of weird and wonderful devices were invented, and this was one of them, the mutoscope. And you just have to put a penny in the slot, look through, and turn the handle. Known as what the butler saw machines, mutoscopes became popular at fun fairs in the early 1890s. Oh, lucky butler. And they relied on an ingenious mechanical system. I'm going to make my own film, a tribute to a star of the mutoscope boom, Sandow, the strongman. Filming is easy. The Victorians had invented movie cameras, but oddly enough, they hadn't invented projectors, and it's the way the film is played back that gives the mutoscope its distinctive style. We've shot our movie, and we've printed out 212 individual frames. All we need to do is chop them all up like this and then peel off the sticky back, stick them down onto this card. That then goes into the box here and when we've got them all ready we can stick them round one of these wheels like that and then I can show you how it works. This is the inside of the mutoscope. I turn the handle and all these cards just flick. It's like a flick book. Watch. Mutoscopes were popular at fairgrounds, but they were never going to have mass appeal. <laughs> Watching mutoscope films was a strictly solo affair. So when the Lumiere brothers of France began projecting films onto huge screens in 1895, the mutoscope fad was over and the golden age of cinema was born. Victorians were known to flee the auditorium as black and white trains seemed to be hurtling toward them, ready to burst out from the screen. Entertainment would never be the same again. When Victoria came to the throne, there was essentially no leisure or entertainment. But the Victorians invented photography, mass travel, package holidays, the seaside, piers, the cinema. In fact, they laid the foundations for all the colossal leisure industry we have today. In fact, they invented free time itself. They were the pleasure seekers. If you'd like to find out more about the Victorians, there's loads to discover on the BBC History website. As the financial crisis claims one more head, Newsnight reports next on BBC Two. Good, yeah. Here we go. Welcome to the breakfast phone in on Five Live with me, Nikki Campbell. Right, let's find out what the nation has to say about today's big stories. And it's Tom on line one. Good morning, Nikki. Five Live's breakfast phone in with Nikki Campbell, weekdays from nine. Now we're talking. Well, well in, in any relationship at some point, you always pretend to be something you're not. There's always that risk that you might be discovered one wrong move and... But... I'm a werewolf. 
Uh, no, no, really. I am. And, uh, I'm really scared of what will happen if anyone finds out. Being Human, Sunday at 9.20, and catch up on all the episodes so far on BBC iPlayer. Newsnight now on BBC Two with Kirsty Walk. What he says about Islam may be.